on your Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party and we are back. My name is Talib Kwali. I am the BKMC, the MCEO, the Gentleman Savage, the Little Lebowski Urban Achiever, Ebony Man, Apollo Legend. I am your host for People's Party, the number one podcast on the planet in the universe, world's best podcast with the world's best co-host, Jasmine Lee in the place to be. Give it up for Jasmine Lee. Yay! How you doing, Jasmine? Amazing. How are you? I'm fucking awesome because... Uh, Today, we're going to have a bona fide movie star, mm -hmm. and I'm a movie buff. Yes, but you know are. what? We live in an era where people could be famous just for being famous. So not only is today's guest a movie star, but he's also a master of the craft of acting. Because mm -hmm. not every movie star is a master craftsman when it comes to acting. Um, this man has been working from the 80s to the 90s to now. And when it comes to directors, you can't really ask for a more... For a, more inspirational list of directors to have worked with from Stanley Kubrick to Robert Altman to Oliver Stone to Christopher Nolan. His career spans almost 40 years. He's been a major part of some of the most iconic films of all time, Vision Quest, Birdie, Full Metal Jacket, Memphis Belle. Wow. He's on Stranger Things. Mm -hmm. All my Stranger Things fans are going to be very excited. Weeds. Weeds too. Miss Virginia too. He's also an activist. An avid cyclist, ladies and gentlemen, a true renaissance man, Matthew Modine is in the house. Yes. Yes. Pleasure. My pleasure. He's so tall in person. He's tall in person and in the movies. It's not all a lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, how you doing, Matthew? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for being on the show. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Thank you. No doubt. Ever since they told me you were going to be on the show. <laughs> you know what I'm Not that long, yeah, but yeah, yeah. long enough. Um, so, yeah, let's get right into it. Um, I want to talk to you about the fact that your father owned a drive-in theater in Utah. Mm. And when you were a younger man, you met Robert Redford, who came into one of your father's drive-in theaters. Right? It was a movie theater. Oh, it was a movie yeah, theater, yeah. not a drive-in. Okay. Well, we had movie theaters and drive-ins, but he was, okay. a, he was a manager. We didn't, we didn't own them. Okay, okay, he's a manager. Yeah, yeah, manager, yeah. Okay, yeah. talk to me about meeting Robert Redford that early in your life and how that impacted you. Yeah, I, I think I was five or six years old. The, the theater was called The Lyric. It's, it's now, it was a legit theater that was turned into a movie theater that mm -hmm. was turned back into a legit theater. It's now called The Promise Valley Playhouse. Okay. Mm. And Robert Redford was there doing pr publicity for a movie called Barefoot in the Park with uh, with Jane Fonda. Yeah, it's a classic. Yeah. I mean, Jane Fonda with the height of her beauty and right. innocence. And, and it was before Barbarella, you know, right. which, you know, blew, that exploded my, blew, her. blew, blew my teenage mind away. Right. <laughs> um, Sexy movie. Yeah. <laughs> sex. yeah she outsexed the sex machine. <laughs> she wow. outsexed the sex yeah. machine. Yeah. That's right. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was extraordinary thing, thing that was impressive about my father's job was that all these people would come to his house, you mm -hmm. know, when we had the drive-in theaters, uh, the drive-in movie theaters were away from society, away from the community, away from the town center, mm -hmm. because it had to be dark, uh, cause you didn't want light competing with the projection, the projection of the movie okay. onto the screen. So we always lived in this kind of rural space that was out in the middle of nowhere and, and our house was next to the drive-in. And so these people would come to my house to watch movies. Mm. And I think that that maybe played a, a part in my wanting to be a part of this profession. Right. Was that, that, uh, that I'm the youngest of seven kids and, mm. you know, with your first baby, uh, it gets cold and, and, you know, fever or something and you rush it to the doctor and say, oh my God, the baby's sick. And then the second one, no, you remember what, this is what the doctor told us to do. The third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, right. the sixth one, the seventh one, right. the, the seventh, seventh one like. to say, don't worry, he'll stop bleeding. <laughs> you know? So my yeah. little sister's going through now. She's yeah. the youngest of seven. Yeah. It's rough, man. Mm. But, but in a way it's, it's magical too, because 
you you get the opportunity to study those people that that came before you and learn from their mistakes and mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's not a coincidence i've been asking this question of actors since i began in the business um, but most people that are actors are the youngest in their families that's interesting yeah Ooh. yeah i would say 90% of the actors and the and, mm -hmm. and or itinerant families so we we moved about uh i don't know a dozen times as, mm -hmm. as a boy because the the land was worth more than the drive-in so they were tearing the drive-ins down and developing it into subdivisions and uh, supermarkets is that part of why the drive-in disappeared yeah okay. and the uh, cars got smaller mm -hmm. and television uh vhs tapes that that was a, a knife in the in the mm -hmm. belly of uh, of um, drive-in theaters uh, and then, you know, cable television, you know, there was more mm -hmm. and more things for people to be able to watch without getting off their butts and going out to watch a movie. Yeah. That's interesting because my relationship with you is based on the fact that my parents were one of the first in the neighborhood to have like WHT and HBO. Mm -hmm. And it's like to see, you know, the, you know, movies from the 80s and early yeah. 90s were just getting run so much <clears throat> on cable television. Um, yeah. I also went to acting school. I went to I got accepted to Tisch and I studied experimental theater. Um, and I decided to become a musician because from my vantage point, I could make money as a musician earlier. The actors that I saw had very hard lives and were working in restaurants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You started off working in a restaurant in New York City. Yeah. Um, I've heard you tell this story about how you went in uh, not expecting to be a chef, but they put you in the back of the kitchen anyway. Yeah, I, I went there to be a waiter because mm -hmm. you could make more money and mm -hmm. tips and things like that. And and uh, the, the the guy Herbie Lipke, he looked at me, he said, "There's no way I'm putting you on my floor. Get in the kitchen." <laughs> and he didn't know that uh, I, when I was 11 years old, I got a job at a restaurant in New York called June's Cafe, mm -hmm. and people said, "That's crazy. That's like child labor violation." That's labor old law. New York. Yeah, but but 11 years old, uh, you know, I told you my dad was a drive-in theater manager, and there's seven kids. There wasn't a lot of money for food, so we. We, I mean, we drank nasty powder milk. Powder Ew. milk is good now, but powder milk back in that day. And my mom got skim powder milk. Ew. And it was like drinking gray water. You put that on your cereal. There was no joy <laughs> in having a bowl of cornflakes, you know. And cornflakes gross. Oh, it was, it was awful. So when I got a job at June's Cafe, that meant I could have whole milk. That mm -hmm. meant I could have butter. That meant, I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I was I was the happiest kid in my neighborhood mm -hmm. being able to go in and eat, eat, eat that kind of food at June's Cafe. So that was my first job was was working at June's Cafe. And then uh, when I started high school, my mom and dad got a, a Mexican food restaurant in Chula Vista San, down in San Diego. That's interesting. Uh, and, a white owned Mexican restaurant. Yeah, yeah, mm. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was Mexican, you know. We, <laughs> we, we were living uh, right by Tijuana, okay. and most of the kids that I went to high school and junior high school with were were Hispanic, okay. Mexican, and and because uh, that's a f such a broad term, Hispanic, you yeah. know, because that that's like from everything south of the border, from Central America all the way down to yeah, South Hispanic America. Is if you're born in a country that speaks Spanish, yeah, and that's really the extent yeah. of the term. But yeah, because yeah. my wife is Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. and Puerto Ricans are so different than Mexicans. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, they it's share a language, but it's a whole different language. Right. They speak it differently. Yeah. Did your parents speak Spanish opening up a Mexican restaurant? My mom did. Yeah. Oh, okay. My mom, uh, Dolores, she spoke pretty well. And, and most of the people that worked for my father were were Mexican in San Diego. And uh, so it was part of my culture that because both my parents worked, my mom was a bookkeeper. And so there was nobody home in my house when I came home. Mm -hmm. So I would go to my Mexican friends' families, Mr. and Mrs. Villalobos. They're my, my adopted parents because mm -hmm. she always had beans and rice on the <laughs> stove. She, mm -hmm. she always had something. And, and so I'd go to yeah. her house after school to, you know, to get a meal. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, it takes a village. Um, that, I mean, on one hand, it's, I'm sure that there's probably people who feel like, oh, this white family owned this Mexican restaurant is like a cultural appropriation thing. But on yeah. the other hand, I, I think that a white kid who's coming up in Utah, most white kids who are coming up in Utah are not having any interactions with any people of color at all. Mm -hmm. Not so, at all. So for no. you to have that as, as, a, as a young person, yeah. probably very impactful. As a boy, the only African-American that I was exposed to was Bill Cosby and Flip Wilson. Right. And then... I don't know. I think maybe in eighth grade, there was one black kid that came to the mm. school and he was so loved, you know, because it was, it was, 
it was something that was so different that it was, right. you know. Well, I'd love to find him and ask him if, if, he, if he felt, felt love. The love. If he felt, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm sh- I, like, that's what's interesting about um, this conversation is, um, you know, you we we never hear, we don't have to hear about the first white person to do something. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? Which is, yeah. which is, it's just, it's, it's, America has never been honest with the race conversation. So yeah. that's really the exposure to other cultures. I feel so blessed coming from New York. Yes. When I hear these stories, mm-hmm. it sounds amazing to me because in New York, I was blessed to grow up with a very diverse amount of, d- diverse amount of people within, within demographics, diverse mm-hmm. white people. Yeah. You know, the Russian Jews were different from the Italians. It was different from the Irish people. Right. It was different from, you know, within black people, the Jamaicans was different mm. from the Trinis. The Trinis was different from the Haitians. Yeah. So I was I was very blessed to grow up with that. Um, but what made you come to New York and work in this restaurant? And you met your wife at this restaurant, right? Yeah. Tell me about that. It's an interesting story, actually. Mm-hmm. That my aunt uh, was a, a a Jewish woman who escaped from uh, her from Germany mm-hmm. to come to New York. Uh, she before they started turning people away because mm-hmm. there there was a, a period of time when when America was not allowing people to 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 escape refugees to right. escape that sounds like now sounds like now right <laughs> yeah. but she came to New York and she when i was uh, about um 11 years old i told her i had an interest in acting mm-hmm. and she took me to a used bookstore and she bought me a copy of konstantin stanislavski's an actor prepares mm-hmm. now I, I couldn't pronounce the man's name and i had no idea what the interior of that book meant mm-hmm. the, the people's names and the and the, the references that, that stanislavski yeah. made and but she gave me that book and i tried to read it and when i was 17 18 years old and made the decision to move to new york city because I felt like if I came to Hollywood, I'd just be another white boy, you know, surfer looking dude, because I was growing up in San Diego at that point. Right. And you were really into surfing at this time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and I thought, I, I, they, I'm going to have no value. There's not going to be anything unique about me if I go to Los Angeles. But mm-hmm. the people that I'd met from New York City, they seemed to have so much more uh, on the ball that they 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 were more worldly. They were more cultured. They were there. There was a greater interest of 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 uh, geopolitics, mm-hmm. and and I thought there was something about New York City that was calling me. Mm. And so I I moved to New York City, and I got that job in the restaurant. And I'd listen to the waiters talking about Ibsen and Chekhov and Eugene O'Neill and Tennessee Williams and. And, and, and I realized that I wanted to go into a profession that I didn't know anything about. So I asked one of the waiters, uh, where could I learn that? And he said, you should go to Stella Adler. Mm. I studied you know, that. Yeah she, yeah, she she would like you. And the interesting thing, I'm sorry, I'm kind of all over the place right no, now, please, but one please, of the continue. movies that I saw in my father's drive-in that altered my perception of the world that we share was a movie called Little Big Man. And this is what music and and film and theater can do to the consciousness is alter it. Mm-hmm. That it help us that we come into life in the community that we're living in, the world that we're we're uh, uh, the the community, the world that we're exposed to. It's like having uh, blinders on a horse. And the more you get exposed to, the more you start to understand the world and get a peripheral vers- vi- vision. And, uh, peripheral view right. of the world that we share and you start to understand the different cultures. So when I was sitting on the ground at my father's drive-in in Orem, Utah with a speaker and some popcorn that I got from the snack bar and I was watching a movie called Little Big Man. And Little Big Man was the first time that they pivoted the camera from white settlers being attacked by savage Indians mm-hmm. to Native Americans being attacked by U.S. soldiers. Mm. And this U.S. soldiers were coming in and they were killing the children. They were killing the ponies. They were killing the warriors, the, right. the, the braves. You know, they were killing everybody. Right. And, wiping and of course people. you grew up on cow, cowboys and Indians. And, yeah. yeah. And I was going to school with a lot of Navajo that were coming mm. from the reservation. And This was in Utah. In Utah. Right. And Chief Dan George was the, the, the Indian chief that was in the film. And he called themselves in the film human beings. Now, at that point, from that moment on, all I wanted to be in life was a human being. Mm. I was so ashamed. I got so woke to what 
through a movie yeah. of, of what that looked like, what Western ex- ex- yeah. expansion looked like. And Donald Trump, just for all your listeners, go back and listen to, if you can stand it, that last presidential State of the Union speech he gave, he used the words manifest destiny. Mm-hmm. Now, no words in that in that speech are accidental. That's he right. He used that. Manifest destiny was... was uh, Two words that were used to explain the Anglo-Saxon uh, push westward. Tell it. That, 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 that said that it was okay to take this land away from That's these right. native indigenous We are owed this people. land. And they used it again when they pushed the Mexicans out of Texas, Nevada, That's Arizona, right. New Mexico, and California. You know, he used those in 2020. That's Manifest right. destiny. So here I am now. All I want to be is a human being. I moved to New York City. I go in because this actor had told me to go meet Stella Adler. I'm sitting out in the room. My my aunt had given me that book, An Actor Prepares. And finally, I get called into the room, and Stella Adler's working at a desk, and she turns around, and she looks at me, and she says, if you've come here for me to teach you how to be a movie star, <laughs> you should turn around and leave right now. Man. Sounds like my grandma. I'm so glad I said what I said in the intro. I don't teach that. <laughs> right. She said, if I'm lucky... I'll teach you to be a human being. Mm. Now she had no idea why I started crying. And you, because you had already you owned wanted. the human being yeah. thing. And then I find out that Stella Adler was a, was a student of Konstantin Stanislavski. So there Don't was connect. a blessing that my aunt had given me this book. And now here I was. Maybe that was what drew, drew me to New York City. Man. But I believe the real thing that drew me to New York City mm-hmm. now is that when I was a chef at that restaurant, one of the waiters came back and said that he there was this girl wanted to order something to go. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm not making it. I'm not making this dish to go because it'll be nasty and horrible. Mm-hmm. You know, and we weren't really a you kind of standards. Take, yeah, we weren't really a takeout restaurant. He said, No, she's a good customer. She comes in. I said, I don't care what she is, I'm not making it. <laughs> no, no, she's I said, You're afraid to tell her no? I'll tell her no. And I came out of the kitchen with my white jacket and mm-hmm. my checkered pants, and I looked at her. And I said, how many do you want? <laughs> and, that, and that was my wife. We've been together now 40, 41 years. It's amazing. And That's a beautiful story. I'd never seen such a beautiful creature in my life. Oh, man. Um, when you said you walked in the restaurant to be a waiter and they made you a chef, how did you look that they said, no, you're not, you're not serving on my floor? I don't know what, I don't know what he saw. I, I, th- I think maybe, maybe he saw me as an 11-year-old boy working at June's Cafe. Maybe he saw me as a teenager working in my mom and dad's Mexican food restaurant. It was called Don Roberto's. Mm-hmm. And, and I was so green, man. I was so green. Mm. I was, you know, when I would ride the subways in New York City, people look at me and say, where are you from? And I said, I live here. And they said, no, but where are you where from? Are you from? <laughs> yeah, because no matter how hard I tried to be a New Yorker. That won't happen no more in they, New York. That's old New York they, now. now. It's they were not going to. And the, one of the like, highlights of my career, my life, was when, they fi- when I, I felt like I finally got adopted by New York City when Madison Square Garden asked me to come in and do the 50 greatest moments in Madison Square Garden's oh. history. That when, when I got to be able to host that, mm-hmm. that was like unbelievable. Then the New York Yankees asked me to do the intro for, for the 2018 season. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, to, to, to be the voice of, 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 of introducing right. the, the new season. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, that, 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 and then I felt like finally New York wrapped its arms around me. Um, let's talk a little bit about Birdie. Birdie. Which is a strange and beautiful film. Yeah. Um, that movie, you've done, I think of your career as like, not war movies. You've done like not three war movies, but movies about soldiers. Yeah. Cause these movies aren't really about the war. Mm. Birdie is about soldiers. Yeah. Memphis bell is about soldiers. Full metal jacket is about soldiers. And I feel like there was some foreshadowing in Birdie when Nick Cage character says, um, he says any other war, we would have been heroes. We didn't know we were getting into with this John Wayne shit, yeah. which, and he's talking about the Vietnam war, right? Yes. But then you do full metal jacket about the Vietnam war and your character Joker is doing a John Wayne impersonation. Yeah. Through, did you ever make that connection? Yes. Okay. Um, I, and I, there was one more that I did with Robert Altman called Streamers. Okay. Uh, with David Alan Greer and, and Michael Wright. And we won the prize at the Venice Film Festival for Best Actor. It had never been mm. done before where they give it to the principal cast. They gave him a Best Actor Award. Mm. So, you know, I grew up with the Vietnam War. My oldest brother, Mark, uh, uh, 
went to Vietnam. I mean, mm-hmm. so then my brother Michael joined, my brother uh, Russell, and my sister Elizabeth. They all joined the Navy. Mm. Uh, so this is this is personal to you. It was, yeah, yeah because when you, when you were a child, you'd watch Walter Cronkite on. I think it was CBS News. Uh, Uncle Walter, and he'd talk about the Vietnam War, and it was something that was uh, abstract mm-hmm. because it was over there, and it didn't it didn't affect you personally. Right. And then suddenly, when my brother was was uh, involved, now he could be he could become one of those statistics, one of those you know one of those people. Right. Uh, that, that that was a casualty of war. Right. And so it became something that was personal to me. And so after four movies about war, and in in particular Vietnam, three of those films, uh, of trying to understand what America was doing in that war, I I, I don't think that there's ever going to be an explanation or an understanding Mm -hmm. of what it was that we were doing. Um, and, And I think that, you know, uh, may all the gods bless Muhammad Ali for t- his yes, his stance uh, of giving up his very title. brave and mm-hmm. courageous. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I I I wonder if 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 I was uh, as woke as him in that at that age that he di- he chose to take that stance mm. uh, that if, if I would have had the courage to do something as 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 bold as, right. as he did. Do you think you'd still have the career you had if you did have the courage to do something as bold as he did? No. Right. No. Yeah, he lost a lot, you know, he, that that's a testament to how great of a human being he was because yeah. he lost everything. Yeah. He lost uh money, fame, everything. He took his title? Yeah, everything. Yeah. Um Nicolas Cage who I'm a huge fan of. Um, he's become in this era sort of a meme <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because of his yeah. acting choices yeah. and his intensity yeah. and his passion. Yeah, he's very memeable. He's very memeable. His faces, <laughs> his everything. What was it like working with a young, fresh Nicolas Cage? It was very different. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, he, I, I, I don't know this to be fact, but I believe it is mm-hmm. that, that uh, Jim Carrey, Nick Cage, and Crispin Glover all studied with the same teacher in Los Angeles. That. That's interesting. I can definitely Your performance of Birdie reminds me of Crispin Glover and Willard. Willard. Yeah. 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 Oh, he reminds me of you because that yeah, came yeah, first. Yeah. And and he and Nick remained friends and mm-hmm. he, wherever they went, people often thought, oh, I loved you in Birdie and he would get really angry. <laughs> and then people would say to me, I really loved you in Back to the Future. Uh, <laughs> As and, George McFly. <laughs> yeah. But I always thought I always thought they were talking about confusing me with Michael J. Fox. No, no, like, no, no, no. Dude, I don't look, yeah. And it was, it was him that, that I finally realized that That's it was funny i need to get him on here he's done some of my favorite interviews now that i do this i watch interviews crispin and i could watch crispin glover interviews all day long (laughs) yeah Yeah. he's a wild one yeah but i think that you know jim carrey's is arguably you know comedic genius genius. and and he had that and then crispin i think is certifiably kind of mad Mm -hmm. I uh, don't mean that in a bad way, but mm-hmm. but he has a madness about him that is is right. He's a sane reaction to an insane world. Speaking of Jim Carrey, you know, growing up, you see all the faces and things that he makes, and you just assume that you know he was just born making faces. And then I had like a, I did like some clowning training, and I found out that that's like a real art form to be able to move your face in in that manner, and that made yeah. me fall in love with him even more. Yeah, you got to do exercises to get mm-hmm. your face to be mm. that that elastic. Yeah, the mask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Alan Parker directed Birdie. Yes. Right? And uh, Bugsy Malone, Fame, Pink Floyd, The Wall, Midnight Express. Unbelievable. Uh, Mississippi Burning, Angel Heart, which my grandmother, Javodi Green, is an actor. My grandmother and my grandfather are actors. They did the National Black Theater with Woody King. Uh-huh. So they 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 knew like Sam Jackson and Denzel and them back in the days. But my grandmother, Javodi, is in Angel Heart for one brief second. Um, but people, a lot of people say Birdie is his best film. Uh, what is it like working with such an iconic director at that young stage yeah. in your career? It was it was unbelievable. You know, Nick Nick Cage he had baby teeth. You oh, know wow. that, that uh, were never going to come. He, he didn't have adult teeth behind the baby mm-hmm. teeth, so he made a decision to have his teeth pulled out because we shot we shot sequentially. We shot all the Philly stuff when mm-hmm. we were young, and then all the v- Vietnam stuff, right. the post Vietnam and Vietnam stuff. Was was afterward, and right. we filmed that in Philly, and then we went to San Jose, California, that, to film that other stuff. That dog food scene was traumatic in oh, Philadelphia. Man. It was horrible. Yeah, it was horrible. And Nick made a decision, you know, to have his teeth pulled out to show 
because he'd been hit by a, a, an explosion and, mm-hmm. you know, and his face was burned. And he, so he pulled his teeth out and, uh, and kept the bandages on all the time. Wow. And Alan Parker felt like that was, you know, look at the sacrifice that Nick is making. What mm-hmm. sacrifice are you making, Modine? Wow. Like you have to- <laughs> Pull like, out a tube. Yeah, you want, hey, he wanted me to stay in the <laughs> right. cell all night long and shit on myself. And, you know, I mean, I don't know right. what, what he expected <laughs> right, me to right, do. Right. And, this is something that I think is interesting and I teach acting classes and just as we have these physical characteristics that have been handed down to us from our ancestors mm-hmm. that's wound up in our DNA, that why wouldn't our ambitions be wound up in that DNA? Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't we mm-hmm. have the aspirations of those people who came before us that, that maybe back in your, in your family generations ago, there was somebody that wanted to sing to express themselves through mm-hmm. song, that there was somebody that wanted to... You, you know, to speak truth to power. And I think that we are li- living manifestations of, of those aspirations of those people who came before us. Mm. And wi- within that, there is also trauma. You know, there's trauma that's wrapped up in that. And, mm-hmm. and I don't have to tell that to an African-American, mm-hmm. the, 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 the trauma that's handed down, that, that it's something, one of the most powerful songs of my childhood uh, that, that was uh, uh, one of those things that opened up the peripheral vision was Bob Marley singing about Buffalo Soldier. That's mm. right. That when you know where you come from, that you know that that's not your history, that's not yeah. your past. This is something that's been put upon you. And and to free yourself from that, mm-hmm. for, you know. And so Birdie, I got down on my hands and knees and I begged that all the people that had been misunderstood like Birdie was, that 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 was having a, like you just said, a sane reaction to an insane world, mm-hmm. that that's what I believe that Birdie was, that he was somebody who, who when he saw injustice, he couldn't live with that injustice, right. that mm-hmm. he had to speak speak against it. And loudly. Yeah, loudly. Yeah. And, and those people are often uh, beaten down and, and, and crucified and, yeah. and murdered for, mm-hmm. for their stances. And, 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 I, and, and I asked you know, any soldier who had ever been, because we didn't use that term then, mm-hmm. post-traumatic stress. But, uh, anybody they didn't know what been, it was. And that's what that movie's about. Yeah, right? it is totally about yeah. post-traumatic stress. And to please come and help me to play this part. And I felt like it was a rush of souls that came into me mm. wow. that, that lifted me up and helped me to play that and interpret that role. Mm. And then I had this unbelievable gift of Peter Gabriel being my voice in the film through yeah. his music. You know, and and uh, he articulates everything that Birdie doesn't say, and yeah. and he he told me we met at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, he, he said that when he was a boy, he was like Birdie with guitars, and and his mother w- mm. just like with Birdie, she says, "I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of these birds. I'm gonna kill them if you don't get outside and go play." Right. That, that Peter Gable would just sit in his room and, and play his instruments. Man. And so he he and he understood Birdie. Um, have you ever seen? Uh, the creator of South Park made a movie called Team America. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about Team yeah. America for a second. Yeah. Um, I love the music. I love Trey Parker's songwriting. Yeah. Um, there's a song in there called Montage. We need a montage. Yeah. <laughs> montage. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I feel like that song was making fun of 80s movies like Vision Quest. Uh-huh. <laughs> Do you agree with that take? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, because <laughs> that's a classic montage. Yeah, a classic montage, man. That's a. I mean, those guys are geniuses. Mm-hmm. Like Trey Parker and Matt Wizzet, Stone. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. I mean, the Book of Mormon. Come on. Oh yeah, yeah. I've seen it like three times. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the best play I've seen. Yeah, ever. And I've seen a lot of plays. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, yeah. Did you really have to train and become a wrestler for that movie? Absolutely. Oh yeah. man. I mean, because. There I was in New York City trying to look like a New Yorker, trying to be right. a New Yorker. So I was I was drinking gallons of coffee and smoking cigarettes, uh-huh. um, going to drama school, you know, and trying to do my best James Dean, trying to, you know, <laughs> and and I was so skinny. I had black circles under my eyes. It was so pale. Mm-hmm. And uh, he'd seen me in Streamers, that, okay. that Robert Altman movie. And he said, you know, I think you're a really wonderful actor. But he says, I don't know if you could do 10 push-ups. I said, I could do 11. <laughs> so he, he, he said, uh, if I'm going to do this film, I'm going to have to go to Washington and train with the, with the team that they were putting together. And that team that they put together, all those kids were state champions. Mm-hmm. And the, the coach, uh, they, they just, they, we did three days. You know, we'd come in and do conditioning, wrestling, and then, and then I'd go... Uh, uh, lift weights. Would you consider yourself a method actor? No. No? No. I, I'm not even sure what method acting means. Um, mm. 
Uh, I think that it's a it's a, a kind of I, I, you know, Stella Adler called it a technique mm-hmm. that you have a technique to be able to access uh, emotions and in, in your your life, but you want to work from your imagination because the the, the what if I'm going to play a murderer? Uh, I'm going to go out and murder somebody in order to understand right. what it is. Joaquin to, Phoenix and other actors went through went through serious things with that, right? Like yeah. trying to do that method. That he got like sick trying to do Shia that LaBeouf. walk the line thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that uh, I, I think that. You know, just as I said, that wound up inside your DNA. There's a murderer in there. There's got to be a murderer, and and mm. the millions of years of wound up in this this yeah. DNA. There's somebody there, and so Let's you find just, it. You got to find it. Yeah. That that um, I have a fascinating past that I'm trying to understand. That that when we speak of uh, reparations and we speak of compensation or re- recompense, um, that uh, my family goes back to the Mayflower. Francis mm. Cook is my one of my ancestors that got off the Mayflower. Mm. Uh, and the oldest wood frame house in America is in Denham, Massachusetts, it's called the, the, the Fairbanks home. Um, so that, that's all pre-revolutionary war. So to, to have an understanding of, of this nation's past and what I, my family may have been responsible with, mm-hmm. with the Native Americans, the indigenous people of this land, that, that, that were they responsible for for uh, helping to bring slaves to this mm-hmm. country or the enslavement of other human beings. That, that that's an important conversation that I know this, the most important thing about this building, the most important thing about the pyramids was the understanding that you have to make a good foundation. foundation. That if you don't mm-hmm. build a strong foundation, that's first. the pyramids would have fallen down a long time ago. That's right. That if you have a relationship, you're in love with someone, that that, that that relationship as you go move forward and have children, if you have a crack in that foundation, mm-hmm. that's what you build your house on. Mm-hmm. And the walls will, will, will start to shift and the roof will start to leak. And, right. and, and in our nation's foundation, there are lies. There, there are things that this nation has done that, that within the foundation of this country are cracks and broken. And we're trying to keep moving forward without fixing those cracks and those right. in that in that foundation that doesn't work and here we are today with having moved forward so far and we think that we've made so much progress but we haven't got down to the root of the problem where that those cracks are right and we're not going to be able to move forward as a nation until we go back like they did in germany and they built a monument for the murdered jew that's mm-hmm. the language that they use in berlin built upon hitler's bunker mm-hmm. is a is a is a monument that they that they they, they didn't try, try to disguise it or, mm-hmm. or make it pretty or decorate it. It's a monument for the murdered Jew. That the right. German people know that they had to acknowledge the crime of what their country did and what the crime of of the, their ancestors did. And that's how you move forward. Mm-hmm. You have, however you want to define what what uh, uh, re- reparations mm-hmm. is or compensation. You have to acknowledge that that what was done to those native indigenous people of this mm-hmm. land, and and I heard Robert F. Kennedy Jr. use this term the other day. He was talking about uh, because it's before there were steam engines, before mm-hmm. there was coal, and you know burning coal. That what was the cheap fuel back then of, of building a country? Africans. It was Africans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and oh. it's when you think about it that way, and the pollution that comes from that. It goes back to your human being thing. Um, you you just opened up a world of of shit to use a term from a movie you were in um, in my in my brain. Yeah. You know what you're talking about is acknowledging your privilege, yes. mm-hmm. uh, your white privilege. I don't have white privilege, but I have other privileges. I have a male privilege, I have American privilege, I have straight privilege. I'm what they call able bodied. That, that's a privilege. Mm-hmm. My parents are educators. That's a privilege. So too often when you speak it to uh, people who are not marginalized or people who are members of oppressor groups. And I'm a member of several oppressor groups. And there's a groups, and I'm a member of several oppressed groups, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of times white people, I think, have a problem getting to that place that you just got to because they think white privilege means you get free stuff mm-hmm. or it means that your life is going to be awesome. Right. And it's not that. You could be a poor white person, right. but your life is going to be, is not going to be based, your, your poverty is not going to be based on you being white, whereas a person of color, sometimes that poverty might be based on them being a person of color. Yes, sir. You're acknowledging, you're, you talk, you, you raised the subject of reparations. Slave masters got reparations. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this country, you talked about Germany 
bravely and righteously building a monument to the murdered Jew. This country builds monuments to Confederate generals and soldiers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the right wing will march to save them, all while saying the Democrats are the party of the KKK. Yeah. It's like, well, the Democrats are the par party of the KKK. Why are KK Vic K voted for y'all? And why are y'all all marching to save mm -hmm. Confederate monuments? I think that the problem is, is accountability. You're attempting to take accountability. And as a black person in this country, I'm not a slave in the definition of slave, right? But I wear the scars of slavery because the social system set up during that, that time are still effective today. Mm -hmm. You d don't own no slaves right now, but you clearly benefit from having ancestors who own slaves. Um, so I think it's it's about not acknowledging that as the problem. You know, and I think that I, I, I commend you for being able to acknowledge it. Mm. But I think it's interesting that you're bringing this up as we talk about vision quests, because that's a Native American term. Was there any pushback from Native American communities when that movie came out? And I heard it heard they're making a second uh, a remake of it as yeah. well. I don't, you can't remake the movie. I, did, it, I thought that was strange when I heard that. I mean, it's funny. The Bill was it Bill Simmons, uh, the sports guy. I think I'm not sure. Name, Bill, I think that's his name. He was he he did this thing where they go through and they they talk about movies and uh, they essentially said if Loudon Swain was alive today what would he be they said he'd be in prison <laughs> he'd be in prison for the things that he was saying you know right. that 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 as I was listening to your show and and um, but with, with Michael Rappaport yeah and, Michael he, and he he was using the B word uh -huh. yeah and he kept saying stop it you know and and you warned him like uh -huh. you because it's a different time right. And it's a different time. The things that Loudon Swain, he's down in the basement with Linda Fiorentino and says, you're fucking my teacher. Why don't you fuck me? And grabs mm -hmm. her. That's like, like almost rape. Like what he was, what he was. It willing. is still, it's actually, it's still a form. It's not even almost. Yeah. yeah. So um, th there's that. I mean, and the, the things that he talks about in the film about wanting to be, he says a coos doctor in outer space because he wants <laughs> right. to be, he wants to be a gynecologist in outer space. Right. I mean, he says, doctor. he says all this, <laughs> all this, all this crazy, crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this sense, if you want to make a movie about a kid who becomes a wrestler, you don't don't remake Vision Quest. <laughs> yeah. Just make a new movie about right. a kid. Who, and it probably wouldn't be a high school, uh, you know, that kind of that style of wrestling anyway. Mm -hmm. It would be MMA fighting. Right. You know, it would it would be a different a different thing. Right. So it's foolish to try try to try to do that. But um, I, what you talked about before about. Uh, the acknowledgement of the past. Uh, well, I mean, Michael Schofling, who played uh, Cooch, uh, his desire, he was lying about being a Native American. He, he wanted to be. He wanted to be because of his own home life, mm -hmm. of his father being an al abusive alcoholic, you know, slapping him around and stuff like mm -hmm. that. He wanted to be a part of something that was more pure, something mm -hmm. that, that had a history, that had a, uh, a rich culture instead right. of the culture that he was coming for. Right. So he appropriated a culture. And I understand that. I mean, I, I did that in my own way with what I, I told you before about wanting to be Mexican, mm -hmm. about the, the, the love and affection that, that I received from the Villalobos family um, was something I didn't, I didn't have in my own, my mm -hmm. own home. Mm -hmm. So uh, you say, yo soy Mexicano. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a Mexican. Right. And, and I, I, you know, I, I don't think that, there's something that's inappropriate about about falling in love with the African American race and 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 the, the 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 familial things that that are part of your culture. There's there's nothing wrong with a desire to 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 want to be a part of that mm -hmm. um, appropriation. Obviously, I can't become a black person, but I can I can love. Rachel did. I can love. Rachel does that. <laughs> she can, tried. I can love and appreciate the culture. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think you do that because you appreciate your own culture. You know, I think the, the first step to appreciating another culture is appreciating your own culture, yeah. mm -hmm. your own heritage. And then you can understand why people would have love. Yeah. And then then your love comes from a place of genuine respect yeah. instead of a fetish, fetishization. Yeah. It's like, because I understand what cultural means, you know? Mm. The, and the problem is like, we know that black culture is super cool. That's why everyone, <laughs> I mean, we know that. But the problem comes yeah. in when you're not paying homage to where the culture came from. Cause like you love, yeah. you said you wanted to be a Mexican because you know, you grew up next to a Mexican family that shows you love, but you know that that's what you're, you're taking from their culture. And you're saying, I got this from Mexican culture, but the problem happens when people take from black culture and then they don't give credit where credit is due. Right. Main example is on the uh, runways 
where we can't go to work smacking on a runway and act like it's shows? yeah the fashion shows they'll like say oh let's just throw it on a runway and act like it's a uh, freaking couture or whatever and it's like you're not saying oh thank you black community for putting this in our minds and giving us this idea mm. yeah well fashion has a lot of work to do <laughs> more than most I, I only heard that that term and i heard it from twitter that I think probably less than five years ago. I'd never heard that expression Which before. Uh, white privilege. White privilege. I'd never heard. And, they, and the, the person said, it's because you have white privilege. Mm. That's and, accurate. And I was like, fuck you. You don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know me. That's, a, that's like, a visceral reaction. Yeah, that was that was the reaction. And then I, because I'm not that person, that if somebody, somebody makes something, I want to try to understand what, why somebody would say something mm -hmm. that was hateful or hurtful to me. And I started sort of meditating on the idea of what, what is it that that person was, was trying to say or right. trying to accuse me of. The and Invisible Knapsack is a book by Robin D'Angelo. I believe she's the person who came up with that, phrase. with that phrase. Either she came up with that phrase or the phrase white fragility. I'm not sure, but she's a white woman. And yeah. Jane Elliott is another one who's, who's good. Watch her video. She breaks it down in a good way. So I started thinking about the, th the times in my life with the with the people of color that that I live with or or my friends, starting with my wife, mm -hmm. and re really reflecting and thinking about the things that that they said that I wasn't paying attention to. Mm -hmm. One of those things would be that if I said to my wife, "Let's go shopping," and she say, "Okay, I got to get dressed," and you say, "What well, you are dressed? Come on, let's go." And she's, no, "I got to get dressed." Yeah, because a person of color, if they go into a grocery store. They're going to look at you a different way. They, when you come in, they're going to maybe watch you a little bit closer mm -hmm. because they think you're coming in to shoplift. Mm -hmm. So th they're a little bit open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I thought yeah. about- You're talking about uh, dealing with growth. Then I thought about David Allen Greer. That, uh, wonderful actor. Wonderful actor. Wonderful Such human. An unbelievable human being. He's a godfather of my children. Oh, okay. wow. And David, because my wife and I were going back to New York, we had a place in Beverly Hills. And I said, David, you stay here. It was before Living Color. It was and early. Early. And I said, you stay here and, and use Carrie's car. And he goes, are you crazy? It's, be, <laughs> right. it's, before, it's before Rodney King. Right. And he said to me, if I get pulled over driving your wife's car, they will pull me out of the car and beat my ass. Mm -hmm. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, mm -hmm. no, you just, I, I let you drive the car. And he said, no, you Doesn't don't, you don't get. So then it got a little bit bigger. You know, I'm getting hip to this, what this person's now saying. Then I was in Atlanta talking to a brother on the corner and the police slowed down and put this, the spotlight on us. And I was indignant. Why are you putting the light on me? What do you think I'm doing, buying drugs? He didn't move. He didn't put his hands in his pockets. He didn't reach for a phone. He did not move because he knew that if he did some kind of quick movement, it's mm -hmm. going to be different. Mm -hmm. And I thought about the times that I've been pulled over and I talked back to the police officer saying, I didn't do that. I, didn't, I wasn't speeding. I didn't make a right turn on a red. That's a death sentence. I'm, and I'm, and she'd be shut up, mm -hmm. shut up, yeah. shut up. And then I started to go, okay, mm -hmm. now I understand mm -hmm. what that person was talking about. Did you see Get Out, uh, the Jordan Peele movie? Yes. Um, it's a movie about like, you know, these people are essentially trying, trying to steal to eat, our bodies, trying to steal people's souls, right? Yeah, and that's some scary shit. Someone yeah. wants to kidnap you and steal your soul. Yeah. But for black people, the scariest part of the movie is when he was about to get away, and you saw that siren. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the movie, I said, "This is a monster movie." Then that cop siren is a monster because the whole movie, I'm like, they're gonna take his soul. But the biggest gasp of the whole movie in the theater was when that cop siren turned on, yeah. and every black person in the theater was like, "Oh." He's dead. This, oh, now he's going to die. Right. He's going to get shot. He survived these fucking yeah. soul suckers. Yeah, yeah. And now he's going to get killed by an yeah, officer by a police of law. Officer, yeah. um, why did, when, they, when they first said that you had white privilege, why do you think that you were so offended by that? Because it's not really an insult. It's just like, you know, a matter of fact thing. But why do you feel that you were offended by hearing that you had white privilege? Be, probably out of ignorance, not understanding what it was and, and using that, you know, that imagine if I said that's because you're black that you right. don't understand something, you know. Right. That that would be. I like, get it on that level. Yeah. So that it was, because it requires become, yeah. it requires, and that's why I talk about the educational privilege. Yeah. I mean, it I requires also, a certain amount of education yes. and travel 
and perspective and wisdom to even yeah. understand that concept. Yeah, mm -hmm. most people wouldn't have taken the time that I did to, to reflect understand. on the, those, mm -hmm. those instances in their life where they to get an understanding of what it is. Mm -hmm. They'd just be offended and that's it. They wouldn't, mm -hmm. they wouldn't, get, right be, wouldn't get beyond their anger. I also saw Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live where he dressed up like Put a- Put on the white. Yeah. And he yeah. gets on the bus and everybody goes to the bank yeah. and they start giving free money. Yeah. Yeah. That's, what, that's, that's what people, when you when people get mad at white privilege, that's what they think we're saying with yeah. that Eddie Murphy That their exactly. life isn't hard. Yeah. Exactly. Um, let's talk about you going from one iconic director to the next and working with Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. Early in your career from Spartacus to Dr. Strangelove to 2001 to The Shining. So many, so many classics under his belt yeah. before he gets to Full Metal Jacket. Yeah. Do you, and he's known as a perfectionist, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any ill uh, Kubrick stories that you haven't shared yet? Oh, man. That I've never shared. That's <laughs> that's a hard one. You know, I can't compare the experience of working with Kubrick with any of the other people I've worked with only because it was two years. It was two years uh, in England working with him. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that that opportunity with, with directors. You, the, the, the most longest film was six months. Uh, but usually it was four and... In, in those days, it was three months, and you, you'd be with somebody. Mm. You have this intense experience. Everybody pushed together, and and it, it's extraordinary, magical, wonderful experience making movies. And then then it's gone. And sometimes you never see those people that you worked with ever again. And um, that's weird. Mm. Um, it's one of the things that I love about black culture especially in music is the the willingness to work together to mm. the, the the way that they cross pollinate and mm -hmm. and that there's a community of like artists right that, that they're willing to to help and work together that the jamie lee fox who i worked with on any given sunday how he mm -hmm. has all these people come to his house on the weekend and yeah. they they, they pull the beam and <laughs> yeah. Ladies. yeah you know <laughs> that's that's so cool I, mm -hmm. I i don't i can't think of a bunch of white people doing that unless they're like country western that's people. community yeah um in that Having movie a, yeah. um it deals especially in the first half of the movie with community that forms around boot camp mm -hmm. and uh uh vincent uh d'onofrio that's his first performance right yeah that's his breakout performance yeah how ill was he in that movie uh you know vincent and i met at an audition for Private School. It was like one of our first movies. And, that was and, the, that movie got me through puberty. That got me. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. so, Talib? Uh, yeah. You know, it's one yeah. of those. It was it's one of those HBO. Yeah. WHT Cinema yeah. Skinamax. 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 That's Skinamax. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. And Phoebe Cates. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, so uh, we had met, and he was studying with somebody from Lee Strasberg School, not mm -hmm. Lee Strasberg. But one of the one of his students, I think Lee had passed away already, mm -hmm. and I was studying with Sel, and there was a big rivalry between mm -hmm. those Strasburg and, and Adler about what was the right way. Was right, it I was in experimental theater, so we were just taking yeah. from everything. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the thing to do, man. Yeah. You take from the best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what we should do? You should come to my class, and I'll go to your class. We'll switch places, and we'll decide for ourselves which is the best one. So he said that's a good idea. So I went to some of his classes. He never came to my <laughs> classes. But I thought it was crazy what was going on in his class. People were slapping each other and mm -hmm. spitting on each other. Oh, and they no. were angry. Yeah, it was it was cuckoo. It was crazy, crazy stuff. And and but he never he never came to my classes to experience what it was like to work with Stella and 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 you know from your te technique and your imagination. And uh, my career took off. Mm -hmm. I I got the part in private school. He didn't. And then Vision Quest and and. Uh, Mrs. Sofal and Birdie. And then I was I, I was walking down the street uh, on 57th Street and he was a bouncer at the Hard Rock Cafe. Mm -hmm. And he was embarrassed because his career hadn't taken off. And I said, dude, you know, you stay ready because I believe in you. I, I know you got what it takes. I was in the room with you. I right. saw you audition. So just be ready because the opportunity is going to come. So I get to London. We shot Full Metal Jacket backward. We shot Vietnam and mm -hmm. then boot camp. So we were shooting all the Vietnam stuff, and Stanley said, you know, I'm really happy with the cast. Everybody's doing a great job, but I can't find someone to play Pyle. Because you, you had a full head of hair, you had to cut your hair. Yeah. Um, he, man, he and was... I he and I said, I got somebody. I said, he's not... Because he was supposed to be really f So you helped him get that role, okay. And Southern, you know, because that's why I called him Gomer Pyle. Mm -hmm. But I, I, think I saw that movie before I saw the TV show. So I remember when the reruns of Gomer Pyle started coming on, right. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
He said, well, have him audition. So I called Vince and I said, you know, he goes, oh my God. I said, no, no, you don't have the part, dude. Right. You, you got you to audition. Right. So he sent it and Stanley said, this guy's really good. You're right. And he said, you think he'll put the weight on? I said, I don't know. You got to- He scared the fuck so out of me. So he kept gaining weight and gaining weight. And and uh, and then he got, the, he got the part. Now, I would never say I got Vince the part mm -hmm. because- what we can do in life is open open right. a door for somebody. He still had to audition. You got to walk yeah. in. You you got to walk in. And he's auditioning for the, one of the greatest directors of all time. So it's yeah. not like yeah. he's just taking anybody off the street. Yeah, he had to earn that part. Yeah. I'm just happy that the world's been able to see what I saw in that audition for a silly for movie. Private school for yeah <laughs> for private school. Um, so that relation, you guys had to become very close in those scenes. Yeah, spend a lot of time together. But it, that was probably very natural, being that this was already someone you had a relationship with. Yeah, except it went off the rails because of those different acting styles because mm. of the method and, and technique. Yeah. So as I, I can got, now see, I now, I now that you're saying it, yeah. I can't unsee it. Now I'm seeing the techniques in the film as I'm yeah. flashbacking. So, so now we're starting to work together and he's, he starts going down into a rabbit hole that, and then he said something to me one day we were, we were, we were marching around most of the other guys in the movie. Cause I said, we filmed in England. Mm -hmm. They were, uh, they call them TAs, Territorial Army. And a Territorial Army, I think that people that join the TA in Great Britain, it's like you can go to jail or you can go in the Territorial yeah. Army. So they well, were a lot of <laughs> a lot of rough dudes. Right. And and they all talk, I guess you know, I mean, right. yeah. <laughs> right. And so well, we-, we Stop, stop, stop. Oh, well. It's not licensed for yeah. you to start doing all right, all right, English accent. Right. That's it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so they were all making jokes and we were having a good time. And we were, and Stanley was waiting for the sun to come down and go through the trees. Mm -hmm. So he said, "Let's do it again. Let's do it again." And he liked us marching through the field because it was making dust, and you see the dust through those shafts of light coming mm -hmm. through the forest. And then he comes over to me. He says, "Okay, stop fucking around. I'm ready to shoot." And I said, "Well, I wasn't fucking around." At that point, Stanley and I had been together for almost a year and a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And you know, like if you told me Matthew were getting ready to, to record, that stop fucking around. Mm -hmm. It's you're not telling me like. Dude. Right. And, and so I said, well, I wasn't fucking around. And, and I'm going back to get back to what they say, number one, right? Go back to the starting right. position. And Vince goes, he was behind me. He goes, yes, you were. And, <laughs> St and Stanley looks at Vince and I look at Vince like, what is that? What's happening? And he says, yes, you were. You were, you were telling jokes with the TAs. <laughs> and St Stanley goes like, come on, let's just go. And he, cause he didn't like, I'm not right. getting involved right, in right, this. Right. Go, you know, he got behind the camera and I said to Vince, I said, so what? So I was joking around with the TAs. So what? He goes, well, you should stop fucking around. And I said, what happens if I don't stop fucking right. around? Bitch? What, <laughs> That's what the you question gonna I would ask. He says, he says I'm going to kick your ass. And I'm holding that M14 rifle that weighs, uh -huh. I don't know, like 15, 20 pounds. Uh -huh. I wanted to bust that thing over his head. I was so, <laughs> so pissed off at him telling me, I was, you motherfucker. <laughs> and so from that point on, all those scenes when I'm buttoning his shirt and and I'm teaching him how to make the bed or put the shoelaces mm -hmm. in, we wanted to kill each other. Damn. Was that before or after the soap scene that that happened? That was, it was before. It was all leading up to the book. So you see me in the movie. I give him whack, whack, whack. Right. Whack, whack. Right, a couple yeah. extra whacks. Yeah. Yeah, and then that scene with you covering your ears with the yeah. man. That's such an iconic scene. Yeah. Um, we had you just we just had Chuck D here. Yeah. Um. Chuck D has a song called Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos. And the first lyric is, I got a letter from the government. The other day, I opened and read it. It said they were suckers. They wanted me for the army or whatever. Picture me giving a damn. I said never. And that song with that video, along that song came out like 87, 88. Full Metal Jacket came out 87. Full Metal Jacket and that song made me be like, fuck the military. Yeah. Mm. I'm definitely not going. This is what happens? Yeah. Fucking Arlie Army? Yeah. Oh my God, he was like a, oh, this guy is in my dreams. Yeah. Like, talk to me about that actor and, you know, just like the, the quotes. Yeah. You could suck a golf ball through a garden hose. Yeah. And you, you're so ugly, you could be a modern art masterpiece. Yeah. And Looks like the best part of you ran down the crack of your mommy's oh ass and ended up a brown stain on the mattress. Right. Jesus. <laughs> like, talk to me about that dude and what he brought yeah. to that movie and to that set. Yeah, the one thing that I wish everybody could experience was his poetry. Mm. He he would write poetry and it was the most filthy, obscene <laughs> poetry you ever heard in your life. Just like his insult, insults, mm -hmm. those things that we just talked about. Yeah. That, that, I mean, it was- it So was, that was from him. 
Yeah, uh, ours experience they, in the they Marines. Transpi- they, tr- they 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 uh, transcribed a whole bunch of things that he would say when he was auditioning because he was hired as the technical advisor on the film. And there okay. was another guy, Tim Colcheri. Tim Colcheri plays the the guy in the helicopter shooting women and children. Oh yeah, that, that guy was Eight War Hell. Yeah, that guy was the drill instructor. Yeah, and that, so Stanley say go audition with the, with the rafter man throwing up. Like that's yeah. how I felt watching that scene. <laughs> but yeah, could continue. Yeah. So uh, he's Stanley would say because we were shooting Vietnam and we're getting ready to shoot boot camp. He said go audition all of these territorial army guys, the TAs, and because we had to we had to cast them. And you can practice your lines. You know, you get in shape as a as a drill instructor now while while you know videotape it and. and so he would go do it. He would do it for a half hour, 45 minutes or something. He said, you know, my throat hurts. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to save it for my performance. And Lee Ermey would say, well, we got all these people that have to be auditioned. I'll do it. Mm-hmm. So he would step in front and just start saying that crazy shit. <laughs> and and then Stanley would look at the videotape and go like, I, I got somebody who's playing the part and I got somebody who is the part. Who is the part. And so uh, poor Tim, you know, he he lost his. But role. He, he, but he, but oh, his damn. that him in that helicopter was, yeah, such an integral part yeah. of that story. Yeah, it was the sort of the, the man that was like the the the, the end of the innocence, right? Yeah, yeah. Stanley did him a good to give give him, yeah. give him that job. I guess that's what being it. a good director is. Yeah. Uh, do you still have people that recognize you from that role? Uh, I don't know. I got a lot of snow on the roof now, you know, but, but yes, I, I don't think I changed that much physically that people still recognize me from Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket made you a part of hip hop because you were Two sampled crew. on Two Live Crew, one of the biggest yeah. hip hop records of all time. Yeah. And it's not just the, the, the Vietnamese uh, prostitute to sample, but it's you like everything. Every- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you met Two Live Crew before? I never met him, no. You never met Uncle Luke or n- no. none of them? I mean, oh, I couldn't believe that it. Up. That was such a cool thing. I mean, that was like the Yankees or Madison Square Garden embracing me as a New Yorker. Yeah. They, they, to, for Two Live Crew to uh, to end up in a hip hop song. The but, but I didn't finish really talking about Arlie Ermey. He, oh yeah, let's go back he, to that. He, yeah, we he, started getting off track. He is just as crazy as you imagine, and mm-hmm. and he. Uh, the thing is, he was yelling so much that people people say like, "You must have been laughing and stuff." And it was no, because when he was in front of you, uh, his breath was so so bad oh, from bad. from so much coffee uh-huh. and nervous tension, and then his throat started bleeding from because because you you know a drill instructor might do that for an hour a day and now he was having to do it for eight hours a day mm-hmm. while we were filming yelling 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 and his throat so started really bleeding so they they were giving less him less tears for that a, shit yes a steroid spray so now you had cigarettes coffee nervous tension blood and steroid Ew. spray that was all coming in your mouth it was an yeah. absolute horror that's real. That's real acting right there. <laughs> yeah, real stanky yeah. ass acting. And, yeah, and he couldn't pull a punch. So when he when he would throw a punch to hit me or slap me across the face, mm-hmm. it, it, it was you real. Know, it was yeah. And sometimes he'd just catch your nose and he'd catch your cheek and slap you across the face. And and Stanley said it looked like a miss. I say, please, he slapped me across the face. He go, yeah, but it looked like a miss. Yeah, do so it again. Vince, when we got out on the on the on the parade ground. Vince went over to Lee and he said, I saw like inside the boot camp how many times Matthew had to get punched or slapped. I'm not doing it. He says, I just want you to hit me full on. And he said, what? He says, yeah, just just hit me as you would. And so Lee went over to Stanley. He said, he wants me to hit him. And he, wow. he said, but he said, it's okay. It looks so real in the or, film. Or, I see why now. Yeah, it yeah. is real. He hits him so hard. His hat spins around on that's his head. right. And then he, like your left side, or the left side of your face and right. whisk, the, bam, that's the right side. His hat just spins around on his head. He gets that hit so hard. That scene was so intense. Yeah. Did he need makeup after the hit? No. No? No. Real acting, baby. It was kind of like, I hadn't seen something like that since uh, that Robert De Niro and... Uh, Smile. It's a long, the, it's the really deer, long. The de- deer, deer hunter. hunter. Deer hunter. Yeah. yeah. I had the two, I had the two VHS. You had to get the two VHS for that movie back in the day. <laughs> and it fit on yeah. one. Yeah. Um, do you still know the rifle prayer by heart? This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I think that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I can't remember the best. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. That's, that's about a good it. lot. Huh? That's a good, good bit to remember. Okay. Yeah. What about your John Wayne? How's your John Wayne these days? Uh, well, is that you, John Wayne? Is this me? 
yeah. no doubt. Was that all right? That was good. Yeah. That sound like the movie to me. Yeah, come here, you old codger. Uh, <laughs> grab a hold of that there wagon wheel. Uh, let me just uh, get some axle grease. Uh, oh, man. He goes, oh, Duke, you got to give it to me right here. <laughs> you Everybody, the whole movie. Everybody's going to want a piece of me. <laughs> that was a recording Stanley Kubrick had. Now, this is something that people don't know about mm-hmm. Stanley Kubrick, is that he had a wicked, wicked, mean sense of humor. Mm-hmm. And that was a record. There was a, a guy who used to do impersonations, and, mm-hmm. and Stanley played it to me at his house mm-hmm. on an old reel to reel tape recorder. It was a guy doing John Wayne and, and uh, Walter Brennan. And it was mm-hmm. John Wayne uh, giving it to Walter mm-hmm. Brennan, wow. having sex with him, wow. while forcing him to hold on to the wagon wheel. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the scene when the gunnery sergeant is confronting Joker for being an atheist. And that's where the, when Joker becomes real, because he stands up to the gunnery sergeant, right? And his eyes seem ballsy for 1987 mm. to me, dealing with atheism is like a bad word at that time. Mm. Um, in many ways, it still is. Um, was it atheism, atheism that led Joker to having the born to kill on his helmet while also rocking a peace button, like the duality of man, like the character says? Um, I think that's a big part of the author uh, Gus Hasford, okay. uh, that, 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 that kind of stuff is what drew Stanley Kubrick to, mm. uh, to the book, mm-hmm. Short Timers. And um, Gus was a very complicated, complicated man, very, very brilliant. Right, because right, right, that was right. the poster. I remember being, I remember in the subways seeing the helmet with the born to kill and a peace, peace sign. sign yeah. And that's what drew me to it. Yeah, in Vietnam, the wind doesn't blow, it sucks. Mm. Um, that poster got... Uh, they wouldn't. They wouldn't publish that because mm. they said, you know, it was, it was too offensive. You can't say sucks on the poster in '87. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. But but I I I don't want to speak for Stanley Kubrick or his family, but I believe this. It, my impersonation, impersonation. My impression of Stanley was that he he was not a, a man of faith. That okay. that uh, he was a humanist. Mm-hmm. And and it's funny because a lot of his films are are considered cruel and mean, mm-hmm. and here's my interpretation of of that cruelty and meanness. That when Hollywood makes movies, that we we pretty things up, you know, uh, old movies about slavery. Mm-hmm. That we make it. It's kind of, maybe it wasn't that bad, mm-hmm. you know, the Hollywood version. You know, mm-hmm. Gone with the Wind, they don't seem to be suffering too much. Mm-hmm. They, they seem to, the black people in the house have, you know, they, you know it doesn't mm-hmm. look that bad. The slavery doesn't look that cruel. Um, but that's, the, what Hollywood does is put this pancake makeup on and, and show us the, our better angels mm-hmm. and, and show us an idealistic version of what, Cruelty and meanness right. looks like, and then like. we package it and sell it to the world. And then the good guy wins, and yeah. and, and love triumphs over over evil, mm-hmm. and, and and good triumphs over hatred. Mm-hmm. And and what Stanley Kubrick was doing was saying, like Michael Jackson, you know, you want to change the world, look at the man in the mirror. Yeah. Start with yourself. And so Stanley was saying, let's look at who we are. This is what, this, there's no limit to the cruelty that man is capable mm-hmm. of. These are the things that we do. This is like in the case of Full Metal Jacket. We are taught our whole life to respect and love one another and, and to be kind and forgiving. And then we, we take those children and we put them in a situation mm-hmm. where we have to beat that out of them. Yeah. Where they stop thinking as individuals, think as a group. So we're becoming and, a soldier. And, and, and pull the trigger before your enemy pulls the trigger. Kill them before they kill you. Wow. And and you got to brainwash and beat the shit out of people in order to yeah. get them to work as a unit. I'm trying to make killers. Yeah, I'm trying to make killers. And then they go to Afghanistan, they go to Iraq, mm-hmm. and then they're on a plane. And then they're they were there fighting one day, and now they're back here in the United States. And imagine the confusion that exists mm-hmm. inside of that that young person's mind. And that's what these films are really. That's that's the thread. That's the running thread. Yeah. These films. What I wanted to do with Full Metal Jacket. Uh, that I made a periodical chart of movie stars in in my mind, and and I put I say okay, let's put all these uh, the, these movie stars. There, there were no African Americans in my my chart. That's the white was, privilege. Yeah, <laughs> it was, there was Mel Gibson, uh-huh. there was Tom Cruise, there was John Wayne, mm-hmm. there was uh, Henry Fonda, there was you know etc. Mm-hmm. And I said now, there they are. 
Is there some common thread that I can now pull from them? What was the movie that made these people into movie stars? So John Wayne was stagecoach. Mm. Uh, Tom Cruise, Top, Top Gun. Gun yeah. uh, Mel Gibson, Road uh, Warrior. Yeah. Road Warrior. Mad Max. Mad Max, right. Road Warrior. Um, there was more more on the my, my chart. Henry Fonda, Grapes of Wrath. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were, they, I had about 20 people on there. Now is there a common thread that I can find between those people? And what that common thread made me sick to my stomach and made me want to get out of this business. It, it was justifiable homicide. Wow. That, that Mel Gibson's family had been murdered and it was now okay for him to go the find those people. Fantasy. Yeah, the revenge fantasy. Tom, mm -hmm. Tom Cruise was killing Russians, the right. ultimate en enemy during the 80s when right. Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. Right. Henry, I've heard that you had an issue with the politic for that movie. I did. Yeah. So in, in Full Metal Jacket, when I had to stand over that young girl's that young Vietnamese girl. But that's the sniper. What my goal was in that scene was to splash blood on the audience. I wanted them to feel mm -hmm. the weight of that girl's death and the responsibility of what we do to young mm -hmm. people when we send them off to go fight in a war and they have to stand over a young Vietnamese girl who's begging them to end her life. Right. And, and take their life of what I wanted to die in front of the audience. I wanted you to see the death of a human being mm. that has pulled the trigger and right. that how he would never be able to recover from that. And, the, and so in the case of, of uh, Top Gun, it was because my wife and I had just gone to, to Berlin, the Berlin Film Festival, and they asked, would you like to go across Checkpoint Charlie and go into East Berlin? I said, I can't go to East Berlin. I'm an American. They said, no, you can go to East Berlin because you are. It's the Berliners who can't go right. into East Berlin. Mm -hmm. I my wife and I were like, yeah, we want to go. Mm -hmm. So we crossed that Checkpoint Charlie, and it was like going Wizard of Oz backwards. We went from a colorful Berlin into black mm -hmm. and white. East Berlin, and it felt like the synagogues and the buildings were still burning. Like and it went back in time. It was, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. And they took us to this monument for where a million Russian soldiers had died fighting the Nazis in the Second World War. And I was like, wait a minute, I, I didn't get taught that. We in don't school. hear about that. I didn't get, and it was not just that million, but it was. We're taught the communism is tens evil. Tens of, you know, tw yeah. twenty million. That some people say they don't even know how many Russians course, yeah. Russians died. And if it hadn't been for the Russians fighting the Nazis, the whole outcome of the war might have been very different. That's exactly right. We didn't get taught that in school. I didn't get taught that in, in growing up in Utah. That's right. And here I was taught my whole life that the Russians were the people that were going to destroy the world. You know, and if it wasn't that, it was the Chinese. The you know, beware the yellow threat. Yeah. All of this kind of uh, fear of the other. And yeah. and so it makes sense that when I came back, the movie that was waiting for me after turning down Top Gun, because I I, I turned it down because of those Cold War politics, uh, because it was it was perpetuating that lie. Mm -hmm. And then I waited and waited and waited and, and then came Full Metal Jacket. I think it's interesting that the scene where Gomer Pyle shoots uh, Emery, uh, Hartman, right? Was his neck. Yeah. When he walks into the head, he says, what is this Mickey Mouse shit? And then right after you stand over the the, the, the sniper girl that y'all found and killed, y'all singing the Mickey Mouse yeah. Club theme song. <laughs> yeah. It's like... That was powerful for me. I never talked to Stanley, but he never asked permission from Disney to use it. He just did oh, wow. it, which I think is fantastic. That's, yeah, man. You never get away with that today. No, you no. cannot. And But it's the words, and Stanley's deep, right? Stanley, mm -hmm. maybe the only genius maybe I ever met in my life. I'm sure I've met others, but but he, his his genius was, was right there in front mm -hmm. of him. Who's the leader of the gang that's made for you and me? me. Who's the leader of the gang? Mm -hmm. The, the, who's who's marching coast to coast and far across mm. the sea, right? So it and it was, goes back to those marching ch chants you were doing also, in the boot camp. It, yeah. it, it, who's the leader of the gang? Who is marching coast to coast and far across the sea? That was, you know. Remember, I told you. I said I don't understand why we were fighting in Vietnam, but was it just for westward expansionism? Was it just to get Coca Cola and right. Marlboro cigarettes into the into you know to to expand? Uh, what I believe is American democracy is that we don't live in in a in a republic anymore, a, democ a democratic society. We live in a capitalistic society. That's that right. we're a corporatocracy. That's right. Um, Joker was a journalist being asked to print fake news. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about Trump's attack on the free press? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I know Donald Trump. I, I know right. him we from New get York City, that. and and uh, he is what you imagine. He is everything that you imagine. Um, I believe that he is everything that is wrong with our country, that he's a manifestation of those cracks that are in the foundation of our country. And his cracks 
are, are going back to his father who, who taught him how to lie and how to cheat the system and, and going back in time to, to, you know, when we, when we, uh, Adolf Hitler in his book, Mein Kampf, he, he learned that shit from America. That's right. You his know, inspiration for his philosophy was American Jim Crow in particular, the yeah. Jim Crow laws and, and, and creating yeah. second class citizens out of, yeah. out of Africans. That f- phrenology or the, yeah, the, the brain the, thing, the, 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 the studying thing. of people's faces and mm-hmm. stuff like that, that all came from here. That's right. You know, with those wealthy, uh, you know, coal barons and institution, uh, you know, the in- industrialists that built America, mm-hmm. they were the ones that saw the master race. Right. Capped as the industry. Yeah. 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 And and that's why I think that we didn't get involved in the war for a long time and why England didn't get involved in the war yeah. a long time. You got a queen whose family is German, you know, right. that the royal family. Right. You know, so that industry right. going back to that foundation again, you know. Right. Now Memphis Blau, Memphis Bell is another war movie about they fighting Nazis in this movie. Uh there's a term in that movie, situation normal, all fucked up, snafu. Yeah. Snafu. That comes, kind of describes where we're at right now <laughs> with, with Trump. Yeah. Um it's weird that it's become normalized. That's yeah. that's the frightening situation thing. normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, talk to me about the scene in which you had the conversation with the plane. Yeah, and what's that like as, as an actor? It, it was it was difficult because it's an inanimate a- object that he's having uh, an emotional uh, conversation with. Mm-hmm. But but I, I I believe my my uncle was a B seventeen pilot. He flew seventeen missions before he got shot down. I wore his dress uniform in that scene. Oh wow! And uh, he asked, oh, this was personal to you again. Uh, very personal to me, and it, it was something that I shared with the cast members when we were making the film. Um, that I asked my uncle, "Is there something I could do in the movie that that I could do it would be a, a tip of the hat to you and and your your friends that you you fought in the war with?" And he said, "No." He says, "That's horseshit." He said, "But." When you put that uniform on, don't disrespect it. Mm. And I, I get goosebumps thinking about it now and, and what that what that represented that those that sharing that with my cast members changed the way that they their attitude toward how they were going to play the role. Because what we were doing was would have been imitating uh, performances by other actors that we had seen. You know, I had a cigar and I was going to, you know, be chomping on a cigar and and it, this kind of false bravado. Mm-hmm. And we realized that that we owed a responsibility to those people who had fought in those things. And the truth of the matter was that if you were doing combat missions, you did love that plane. That plane right. was was not an inanimate object. That was okay. a living thing that that right. was that was getting you through. I through guess missions. that's what that scene was. About. And that relationship that you had with the other people on the on the airplane that you were a living organism. That you you were uh, like you know it's one body, but it's, it's two hands, and they have to work in concert with one another. It's why you don't shout when you're on those radios. You mm-hmm. don't scream and yell because you create chaos. Mm-hmm. So when things were most frightening. And, and terrible that they spoke very calmly over the radios. They say, look, eight o'clock, there's a Russian, you know, a German Messerschmitt coming in. Eight o'clock, you know, now he's at nine o'clock. They, they spoke so calmly on the, on the thing. So wearing the uniform and speaking to the airplane and, and, and knowing my uncle's uh, having flown 17 missions before he got shot down, almost lost his, his uh, left arm uh, in Belgium. Uh, it, 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 it was personal, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 it was a different war. It wasn't Vietnam. It, it wasn't. It was. Um, it wasn't Iraq, and it wasn't right. Afghanistan. It was. Those soldiers f- felt like they were doing the right, righteous, walking y- in the path of righteousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we were fighting a war that had as clear a, an objective as maybe since the American Civil War, mm-hmm. where where we had an understanding of what we had to abolish in order for those first words of our Constitution, mm-hmm. "We the people." to have significance and meaning in in a in a in a in an evolving country right that we have to continue to evolve and fight for those those things because otherwise uh, it, it, they're they're empty hollow words um talk to me about working with yet another iconic director you you're just like batting a thousand with these directors at this point Oliver Stone yeah we talked a little bit about any given sunday earlier but i'm very interested in your i feel like your character to me was out of a out of a cast of interest interesting characters was might might be the most interesting for me the doctor the nfl doctor did you get i I know that the nfl wasn't happy with that film no did you get to chop it up with actual nfl doctors and get the real scoop yeah there was a book you're okay it's 
it's just a bruise. Mm. Uh, he was a, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Uh, he, he was a do- doctor for the uh, Oakland Raiders. Mm-hmm. And he was the person who started to introduce sports medicine mm-hmm. and, and saying that maybe you don't want to eat a steak before a game and a, and a quart of ice cream. Mm. That he, he started to transform and introduce nutrition to um, athletes mm-hmm. and, and say the things that he did, that, that you have a, a, a concussion or you yeah. have a, a, something that could cost you your life, that you have to think beyond, you know, the, the 25 years that old that you are, mm-hmm. the 22 years, how, how those young ages that those people, in the, when we're that young, we think we're going to live forever. Right. And we, we don't think that we're going to carry those injuries into our old age. And he understood that and he tried to implement that into the, into the NFL and people hated him. Because because they were they they were just players were just right. something that you negotiated with and right. traded and not and, human beings and when they were done you got they somebody call them new forty million dollar mm-hmm. slaves but what's interesting is that you're acting with actual football players who are dealing with these actual issues yeah. and you're playing the role of a doctor yeah. how intense was that it was pretty, pretty, pretty I mean it was wonderful to be around them I mean Jim Brown and mm-hmm. Lawrence Taylor yeah I mean um, they experienced those things for real yeah. It was the first time that I'd really been dipped into black culture, mm. and and Oliver Stone told me. He said, "You got to you got to understand, Matthew. This movie is about black culture. Mm-hmm. That this what the, the you know you you have to understand that, that that's what football NFL is. Right. But it was it was a fascinating thing for, for me that that film. You know that I, I found myself in a car with Jamie Foxx and LL Cool J and mm-hmm. James Brown." Jim Brown mm-hmm. and 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 uh, Al Pacino was he there? No, I was not. <laughs> no, I was the only white dude in that in that car. I met Al Pacino in Harlem yeah. at my friend's house. He was a friend of my friend's mother when I was a teenager, and I was I remember thinking like Al Pacino just be hanging out in Harlem with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I heard that yeah. LL and Jimmy Fox had a fight on that set. Yeah, were you there for that fight? I was there, but I wasn't there. Okay. I, I mean, was it a fist fight or an argument fight? No, they fought. I think I've seen them both oh, talk fight, about fight. it. Yeah. yeah. They, they're cool now. Yeah, they're, yeah they're, it would t- you know, things happen. The it was comp- some actor shit, though, right? It's it like would, their, their characters were, were at odds. Yeah. And it, went, it just went too far, right? Yeah, yeah. And did Puffy have that role before? Puffy did. I heard that he was just too busy. Uh, the, the, what I heard, because that happened before I got down to Florida was that, that he, he said, you know, you just cut to close-ups of me in the, in the mm-hmm. helmet, mm-hmm. but I'm not really going to play <laughs> and, and I'm not going to really throw the ball. You get Puff somebody else. That. Yeah. And he didn't have a, a strong throwing arm. He wasn't, right. he wasn't, and Jamie's, and Jamie's, athletic. Jamie's an athlete. He's yeah. an athlete, comedian, what singer, What doesn't Jamie Foxx do? Yeah. He's Willie Beeman. Um, I heard that yeah. Jamie Foxx got that role by making that Willie Beeman video of that song. He made the song in a video and sent that. Oh, really? And I heard that's how he got the role. I, I did not. By hear, making the yeah, music video. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a trip for me, man. I mean, uh, you know, there I was working with Al Pacino mm-hmm. and James, James, James Woods, yeah. who I think he's an amazing actor. He's, he's, he's an amazing actor. He's batshit crazy. We'll say that about him. We'll give him that. Yeah. He, he, uh, <laughs> but he plays the characters. I mean, from his, I watched a film he did about, what's the film where he went down to, he was a drug dealer that went down to South America. Yeah. Oliver Stone movie. Uh, it was an Oliver Stone movie. He uh, played a, he played a dick in that movie. Yeah. He played a dick in any given Sunday. He's like very, very good. He, he, he knows which roles to pick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I, I see it. I, I can watch him as an actor. Cause I'm like, I believe him. Yeah. The first <laughs> movie I saw him in was The Onion Field by okay. Harold Becker, who directed Vision Quest. Mm-hmm. And and he's a murderer. He 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 kills somebody and he thinks he's gonna get away with it because of some kind of Lindbergh law. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lindbergh uh, law, wow. Yeah. James Woods is a is a is a whole mess. Mm-hmm. Um do you find it ironic that one of your most recognized characters was named Joker? And that you ended up in Dark Knight Rises playing yeah. a cop trying to make sense of Gotham <laughs> yeah. after the reign of the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just thinking about this last one, you know, that Joaquin Phoenix was in. Right, and people, people, they were putting, um, uh, you know, memes up. Of, I saw the meme. Yeah, who who played it best? And they they, <laughs> they shit it on Jared Leto. Yeah, I don't think Jared Leto was that bad. I'm just gonna put that out yeah. there. I'm not with the whole anti Jared Leto thing. Yeah. I think he's a fine Joker. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But Private it Joker got a lot of votes. That. You know, people, okay. a lot of people were saying that they, that somebody made one with Private Joker. You know what I'm saying? This is my rifle. This is my gun. Mm-hmm. This is for fighting. This is for fun. Mm-hmm. 
and they they have me on those steps that are in the poster that that, yeah. that uh, Joaquin is dancing. I just down. filmed a video on those steps. Oh, you did part of my video, my new oh, video that's cool. for my new song on those steps. Because yeah. the song is about a dedication to New York City. It's cool. I love I love when people people are creative and they they make that kind of stuff. It's it's really right. fun, and you know, and it it. Uh, like last night on on uh, Jimmy Kimmel, he was talking about something, and the the Donald Trump was going through firing people, and he's get he's got to the M's, so he said, "Watch out, Matthew Modine." <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just you know, or or like uh, the Jonas Brothers call you up and ask you to be in a in a music video that they're doing. Um, I grew up in New York City, riding my bike around. Um, I still ride my bike around when it's warm. Um, I don't wear a helmet. Um, isn't it against the law now to not wear a helmet? It's not no. Okay. There's no helmet law in New York. Okay. Yeah. You people just yell at you. They yell at they, you. Yeah, like they think you're irresponsible. What's the matter with you? Right. Hey. They're they are they are concerned. Yeah. I used to ride with my daughter on my on my hip. And, and no helmet? And no helmet, right. And people people get so angry. And I was just like, why don't you mind your own business? Because, because <laughs> I would have said something. Isn't that an said, adrenaline rush riding a bike in New York City? It is. Yeah. I, my yeah. Kid, my daughter, who's now 21, reminded me recently. <clears throat> she's like, Dad, when I was like 12, you made me ride to Times Square. And I lived in Brooklyn, you know, but I, yeah. I, I did that. I remember riding across the Brooklyn Bridge with my daughter and her not being able to get over the hill. Over the hill, And yeah. maybe have to stop and like... Come Push on. her up. <laughs> yeah. That's so and cute. we rode all the way from Brooklyn. But wow, that's a ride. Yeah, man. We used to have fun. I just had that similar experience with my father riding out here. It was like four miles. I almost died. <clears throat> Midtown is a difficult place to ride. It's a there's so many people and so many cars and it that that's there was one, I think Colin Farrell or somebody did like a bike movie. Kevin Bacon did one. He did Quicksilver. Quicksilver, yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. That's like one of those 80s. Like you're you're associated yeah, that, with these 80s that's movies. That's a montage movie. Montage, that's a montage movie. Yeah. Uh, you're in Stranger Things. Yeah. And Stranger Things is like a, a homage to sort of 80s culture. Mm -hmm. um, what's it feel like coming full circle like that? It's You know what? It's a gift to be given another generation, you know, mm -hmm. that... that mm -hmm. uh, I saw Danny Glover going up a flight of stairs. Danny Glover was in Birdie. And yes. they, they, they cut the scene out. They, I read that when and, I was researching. Yeah. yeah. And he, I just saw him in Jumanji with Kevin Hart yeah. doing a impersonation. I love Danny. <laughs> Danny Glover. <laughs> Danny, Danny, the, he, you know. He's an activist too. We talk about reparations. Yes. Danny Glover is at the forefront of the fight for reparations yeah. for African Americans. Yeah. And he's and he's been like that. He's yeah. he was down with the Black Panthers. Like Danny mm -hmm. Glover's the real deal when it he's comes the to activism. He's the real deal, yeah. yeah. In San Francisco. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, Bay Area yeah. dude, you know, yeah. he's a special breed. He's a real dude. Yeah. And 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 I love him. That's why he's in that Boots Raleigh film. Mm. Yeah. Uh he's playing an Oakland dude. <clears throat> But I saw him going up a flight of stairs, and I said, "Hey, Danny, what's going on, man?" He said, "I'm just still just fighting to stay relevant." Mm. And and as an actor, as a, as a musician, uh, you you got to do that. You you always got to stay relevant, stay stay in the game, mm -hmm. um, because especially in this town, Hollywood, that they don't they don't consider your career. They they want to know what you're doing right now or what mm -hmm. you got coming out. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the, the the resume don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does in Europe, it, you know, in, in different places around the around the world where people really appreciate artists, mm -hmm. and uh, especially in Italy and England. Uh, but but so to be able to be on Stranger Things and and to be able to capture another generation of young actors who don't know Full Metal mm -hmm. Jacket, who don't know Vision Quest, who don't know Weeds, mm -hmm. uh, those, those things that that it's it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity because mm -hmm. I I get to keep my foot in. I'm, I'm still in the game, baby. <laughs> yeah. Word up. I love seeing you play a politician in Transporter 2 uh -huh. with Jason Statham. You also recently played a politician in Miss Virginia. Um, now, you don't strike me as a right-wing guy, mm -mm. but that movie was critiqued by people like Robert Ebert, Roger Ebert, as saying that it was like a right-wing leaning movie. What do you think about that criticism? The... the the de Soldado, the uh, Sicario one? Not Sicario, no. uh, the Miss Virginia. Oh, Miss Virginia? So Miss Virginia, before you answer, I just want to yeah. say that I, I haven't seen that movie. Yeah. But from the clips I've seen, I was someone whose parents, uh, Uzo's character was reminding me of my mother and what yeah. I've seen because my parents, I was messing up bad in school, getting into street situations. And my mother and my father were educators, but they worked they asses off and took on second jobs and everything mm. they could to get me in boarding school. And then mm. my parents didn't do what they did to get me out of the streets into boarding school. They saved my life with that. <clears throat> so 
I want to see that movie because it looks like it uh, something yeah. I could relate to. Yeah. But then when I started doing the research, I started seeing this criticism as saying that it was like mm. this right wing thing. So I wanted to get your take on that. Well, uh, first, uh, a sh shout out to the real Miss Virginia, mm -hmm. Virginia Walden Ford, who uh, whose child was was in a in a bad school. Now mm -hmm. I told you I went to about a dozen schools growing up and moving, mm -hmm. and I know that when you your house is here. And, and the good school is right there, and yep. the bad school is right there. You're going to be going to that one. Mm -hmm. yep. And it just you know could be 500 feet is the difference. And you're, you're going to the one that doesn't have any money, doesn't have any resources to, to, uh, to help educate because they don't have the money because right. of, of taxes or something. So the impoverished neighborhood that Virginia Walden Ford lived in, that, that her son was in, in trouble. He, she, he, he was a, a, a bright young man who was not going to have the opportunity because he wasn't in a good school right. with good resources. I relate to this story. And so she said, why can't... And she discovers that the, the that how much the government spends sending the child to a public school is more money than it costs them to send a child to a private school. Yeah. So she said, why can't I get that money in a voucher you know, to go to that private school, this voucher system that, that she helped to institute and has now succeeded in, in changing the lives of thousands mm -hmm. of, of inner city children mm -hmm. in her community in Washington, D.C. And uh, her son ended up graduating with honors and went to college. And uh, so big shout out to the real Virginia yes. Wallen Ford That's because she's, she, she is you know, transform the, you know, which is no greater gift than to give that to children. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I believe that the Oscar race began last year when, when I saw Uzo Aduba in this film that I thought her performance was Oscar worthy. It was, it was wonderful. But it, my character, when you meet him, he's a guy who gave up. He's a politician, you know, that that's the problem with term limits, that there, that there's no term limits. Right. That once those people get in, they can just stay there for the rest of their lives. They become politicians for a living. And yeah. their job becomes to just make sure that they keep that position. Yeah. So my guy, I, that's why I've got a costume that kind of was 10 years out of date. You know, mm -hmm. the pants were a little bit too short. Makes they, sense. They, they, the tie was a little bit too wide. And, and, uh. I, I fell asleep with my hair wet, and when I woke up, it was sticking straight up. And I said, "Oh, well, that's perfect. That's how I'm going to wear my hair in the movie." And he's somebody who enjoys a glass of scotch, right? And so I just and he, and playing golf. That that's what his his professionalism was mm -hmm. was was uh, just kind of coming showing up to the office. Yeah, and sounds going, like a caricature of a U.S. politician. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and what Uzo does to him is that he was somebody who had. Uh, a desire to help the people, to work for the people, that you to remind that, that this role movie should do is remind people that those people are elected officials and they their responsibility is to represent the people that they who put them into those the mm -hmm. seat that they have. And we forget that. Mm -hmm. Those are elected politicians. And when they don't do their job, it's our responsibility when you live in a free and democratic society to push those people out because they're not representing you. That's right. And people get lazy and they don't vote. And or there's voter suppression, and people aren't aren't given the opportunity to vote, mm -hmm. and that's a that that's a criminal thing that that exists across our right. the United States, and we we that's another it's conversation. Disproportionately affects people of color, unbelievable, and poor people unbelievable yeah, voter suppression. So she wakes that fire in his belly, and and gets him to to she reminds him of what his responsibility is, and she pulls him out, and it, it that character. Uh, uh, Clifford Collins, I think, is something like that. Cliff, Clifford something, uh, the character that I play. He's one of my favorite characters I've I've mm. ever played, and because he's just he, he's just so silly, and <laughs> and he gets he gets woke by right. somebody who when he'd given up, you know, the, the, what what a what, what a great thing that if if somebody watches that movie because that's what movies do, that's what plays do, that's what songs do. Mm -hmm. We started this conversation mm -hmm. is that they. They remind people of our goodness. They remind people of our possibilities. That's and, right. you know, and, and, and is, I don't think I finished that thought talking about Stanley Kubrick and looking in the mirror that we have to look at our mirrors and see the pimples and see the warts and see the ugliness mm -hmm. if we're going to transform ourselves. If we keep making make-believe movies where we, 
where we mm. see ourselves in idealistic ways where that cavalry arrives and mm. saves us in the nick of time. It, it doesn't work that way. We are at a, at a period of, uh, I've been an environmentalist my whole life. That's why I did the bicycle for a day right. in New York City, is that somebody asked me if there was one thing that I could do to improve the environment, what would it be? And I said, ride a bicycle. Mm. Use, a, use a bicycle instead of a gas-powered vehicle. New York City is relatively flat. You can get from Brooklyn to New York in a half an hour. Mm -hmm. You can get the Bronx. You know, I ride my bike to Yankee Stadium. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes from Greenwich Village. You know, it's very doable. And I like riding my bike in the in the rain and in the snow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know. I, right. In the <laughs> but, snow? So, yeah, I do. Um, so. <laughs> You're officially a real New Yorker. Wow. Yeah. That's why I started to say was that, that, that there is no greater urgency right now than in maybe the history of the world for us to alter our behavior. And if you were looking for any proof that, that human beings are affecting the climate, use the coronavirus as an example of mm -hmm. what's happening right now. Because mm -hmm. not since 9-11, when there were no planes flying over the United States, that we were able to measure what the effects of airplanes flying over the country, that the, the, those, those climatologists were able to go out and measure it. That, that we can see right now because of, of, of China and, the, and the, the roads were shut down, mm -hmm. the factories were shut down. It is measurable. We can see the effects that human beings are having upon the planet. There have never been, if you don't believe in climate change, there, do you believe that there has, has ever been this many people on the planet in the history of the planet? Right. Is there been any other time in the history of the planet that human beings have been consuming the resources of our planet at such and an unsustainable too. pace? Right. Yeah. There. There. We. We can't continue down this path. You can't have an economy that's based on consuming because we'll. We, we, there's no place to throw our garbage. That's right. And the limited. We are. We have a limited amount of resources of our planet that we are consuming it at an unsustainable pace. What a good thing about science is. It's uh, especially the scientific method is it's based on fact and facts yes. don't require the belief. Yes. So as long as you get people to focus, which America has done a terrible job of, yeah. but if you get people to focus on the facts and not the beliefs, yeah. we'll be, we'll be better off. Yeah. Um, you don't just ride a bike. You also ride a skateboard around. It seems. I do. <laughs> and last year, uh, TMZ caught you at the airport yeah. missing a tooth. Yeah. I was missing my tooth because you bust your ass on a skateboard. Yeah. Tell me that story. Well, it's one thing you don't want to do is, while you're skating, is get a text message and look at your oh phone. Oh my gosh! Don't text and skate. Yeah, He's a don't, millennial. Don't text and skate. Yeah. I mean, yeah, stupid, really stupid. And and I caught a caught a curb and and um, face planted. I thought I broke my nose because it sounded like glass broke in my head. Wow! And it was uh, my tooth, uh, and so we had it pulled out. Uh, the, the bagel uh, finally uh, I had bit into a bagel and that, that was the end of the tooth <laughs> but, oh wow uh, yeah so I had to have it pulled out and what happens when they screw that that um, implant in the, the not what's called a post when they screw the post into your head that that's almost it was almost at my eyeball where that's screwed mm. into your head and they put pig bone and, and human cadaver bone. That's kind of the cement that they mm. screw that thing in and then they put a temporary tooth. But every time you bang it, it felt like somebody was poking me in the eye. Jesus. So I told them, I don't want the temporary tooth. I'll just, right. I'll just rock a hillbilly look for. Right. You'll be Nick Cage and Birdie. <laughs> and then did you get your tooth back or did they get, what happened? Uh, no, the tooth is dead. It was gone. So this is a temporary. And today when I leave here, I'm going to go get the uh, permanent tooth. And on that note, <laughs> we don't want to hold this man up for getting his permanent tooth. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the legendary, Thank the iconic Matthew Modine. Thank you for Thank having you me, man. Thank, Thank you. you.